I've been reading the book of Romans, Paul's epistle to the Romans, and particularly uh, chapters nine, well, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. And to me, there there are some real strong indications in these chapters, like there are in many other parts of Paul's writings, that he believed that. He believed in something that you might call universal reconciliation, i.e. that all people will eventually be saved. No one is going to end up burning for hell forever and ever, as is the common Christian understanding, but rather everyone will be saved. And particularly, I want to focus in this video on chapter 11, which is focusing on the nation of Israel, because there are, for me, in this chapter here, if you read this chapter as you know plainly as possible if you go by the plain meanings of the words that Paul's saying here or at least as as plain as we can get them through the English translation I don't speak Greek uh, it does look to me very plain that Paul seems to be trying to tell the reader that all Israelites will be saved so I want to go through the the this chapter 11 and I want to go through it verse by verse and I want to kind of show you how I'm coming to this kind of idea and then you can tell me whether or what you think really am I wrong where where do you think I'm going wrong where do you think I'm going right what am I missing are there more is there more I'm I'm, I'm 100% sure there's more to this than I'm I'm getting but um you know prayerfully as we go through I pray that you know uh, others will guide me and the most high will guide me to understand it as I should be understanding it so let's get let's get going Romans 11 I should give a real quick bit of context in the previous chapters previous couple of chapters Paul's been talking about how there is a remnant of Israel not all Israel is Israel he said at the beginning of chapter 9 he talks about how he's heartbroken that his people the Israelites are unbelieving they're not believing in the Messiah they're not believing in Yeshua and he says that basically he talks in some quite uh terms that have become quite controversial because it talks about how there's a uh, you know Elohim has hardened some of them the Israelites and some of them have been elect and the elect have fa- have found faith in Yeshua the rest have been hardened and he and he talks about that and he defends the the sovereignty of the most high to say well he can harden who he wants to harden I'll may I'll, I'm sure I'll talk about that concept in a, in a future video but um so he talks about that he talks about the whole issue of faith versus works and the, the law versus grace and so on in chapter 9 and chapter 10 then he comes into chapter 11 that's the brief bit of context then he starts by saying I ask then has Elohim rejected his people by no means for I myself am an Israelite a descendant of Abraham a member of the tribe of Benjamin God or Elohim has not rejected his people whom he foreknew do you not know what the scripture says of Elia when he appeals to God against Israel saying yeah they have killed your prophets they have demolished your altars and I alone am left and they seek my life but what is Elohim's reply to him I have kept for myself this is Elohim saying I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at this present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace, or remnant according to the election of grace, other translations put it. But if it is by grace, then it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel has failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened as it is written and he quotes uh, as he does several times in this whole section he quotes a couple of portions from the talk from the Tanakh from the Old Testament so called he says in verse 8 as it is written Elohim gave them a spirit of stupor eyes that they would not see and ears that they would not hear down to this very day and David Dawid says let their table become a snare and a trap a stumbling block and a retribution for them let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever so just to recap what Paul's saying here Paul's saying that first of all Elohim the most high father has not rejected Israel however as I said as he as he talked about in chapter 9 when he's talking about uh, the elect versus the the rest he talks about how he called uh, you know the, the the children of Abraham, the children of promise were 
Israel rather than the children of the flesh. Basically, par- comparing Isaac to Ishmael, and then he talks about Rebecca, how Rebecca had children, and even before they were born, even before they'd done anything, the Most High said that I have chosen, uh, I have chosen y- Jacob and not Esau they'd not done anything but the most I had chosen Jacob and then later on he, co- he quotes as well from I think it's is it Hosea Hosea one of the prophets anyway uh, much later on saying Jacob I've loved Esau I've hated and then he defends the the the, 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 the right of the most high to choose now I, w- I would just briefly say that for me when I read those portions I kind of see in there not just the sort of you know, choosing people to be saved and choosing people not to be saved, but more so choosing people to do the Most High's work in a particular age. So Jacob's seed were chosen to do the Most High's work, not Esau's seed. Uh, and also, as well, there's an element in there of when he talks about Pharaoh and fa- hardening Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. If you read the, the Genesis, Bereshit, Pharaoh, or, um, it's Exodus, isn't it? Vaikra. Is it Vaikra? Anyway, Pharaoh hardened his own heart, first of all, and then the Most High hardened him. And he says, you know, I've raised you up in order to show my power and my, you know, my love to my people, basically. And that's what I understand this here to mean, is that the Most High has chosen an elect, a group, a portion of Israelites now, uh, you know, in the age that Paul was writing. And, and I understand that age to be continuing to this day. Whereas the remainder have been hardened because of what though we'll see later on it's not just the most high has hardened them just because he just hardened them but he hardened them i think because of their unbelief they they didn't believe and so he hardened them in order that his purposes might you know might stand and this is what paul talks about let's let's carry on reading here he says verse 11 so did they stumble in order that they might fall it's a good question isn't it did did the Most High cause them to stumble so that they would fall and i.e. be cast away? No, because he's already started the whole this whole section. He's already started it by saying, asking, you know, has Elohim rejected his people? No, by no means. He says it twice. Elohim has not rejected his people. Uh, so let's go back to verse 11. Did they stumble in order that it might fall? Did, did the Most High, you know give them eyes darkened eyes and you know a stupor and all that has he hardened them so that they might fall no by no means paul says rather now here's where it gets really juicy rather through their trespass salvation has come to the gentiles so as to make israel jealous now if their trespass verse 12 means riches for the world and if their failure means riches for the gentiles how much more will their full inclusion mean that's an interesting question isn't it he's saying that so yes israel has has trespassed the majority of israel has trespassed so as a result of that the riches for the gentile meaning that salvation has come to the gentiles meaning that it's been opened up this is the mystery that paul talks about in ephesians chapter 2 i think it is 1 and 2 it's and 3 he talks about the mystery being that you know that was hidden in in times past that it's not just Israel. It's not just the Israelites who will be saved, who the most high, who are the most highest people, who are the most highest called out ones. It's everybody, include it's the Gentiles as well, and this is what has happened as a result of the work of Yeshua, the Messiah. He is the one who has caused. He is the the, the stone of stumbling that has caused Israel to stumble, or uh, the majority of Israel to stumble, but the Gentiles have been opened up as a result to this way of salvation. Verse 13, Paul says, Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am as an, uh, am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews, uh, I think the, the, the Greek actually says, to make my flesh jealous, meaning my people jealous, and thus save some of them. So Paul's very clear here. He he's desperate to, you know, to get the Israelites to turn to Yeshua and to follow Yeshua. Now this is very interesting. Verse fifteen: For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? That's a big concept. That's a big thought, isn't it? What does he mean by that? Well, Paul's saying, 
you know, he, he said in verse 13 or 14, he says, I really want the 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 Yehudim, the Israelites, to turn to Yeshua. Why does he want the Yehudim to turn to turn to Yeshua? He says in verse 15, because if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, i.e., if through the Israelites rejecting Yeshua, or the all but the remnant rejecting Yeshua, as a result of that, that's brought reconciliation to the world. We've seen in other parts of Paul's writings, for example, in chapter five of this very same letter, how he taught very clearly that God, Elohim, was reconciling the world to himself through the death and resurrection of Yeshua. All things have been reconciled to the Most High. He reconciled all things in heaven and earth to himself through Yeshua. And so he says that that, that is connected to the rejection you know, the rejection by the bulk of the Israelites of Yeshua is part and parcel of that opening up to the Gentiles. But then he says, what will their acceptance mean? Meaning that what will what will happen if the you know the 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 rest of the Israelites accept Yeshua? He says, What will it mean but life from the dead? That's that's to do with resurrection, isn't it? He seems to be saying here that the acceptance of the of, of the Israelites will be accompanied by resurrection from the dead. So, you know, a lot to unpack there. He carries on in verse 16. He says, If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the lump. And if the if the root is holy, so are the branches. What does it mean holy? Well, in this context, it must mean holy as in the people of the most high, the called out ones of the most high. The people of God. So, what's the dough? The dough is oh, the first fruits. What's the first fruits? The first fruits is the it's the remnant of the Israelites. I would see that as the elect remnant of the Israelites who have turned to Yeshua in this current age that Paul's writing in. And he's saying that if that um, remnant is holy, well, so is the whole lump. I so is the rest of the Israelites who the lump, the first fruits came out of. And he says. So, so just to say that that is a strong indication there for me of, of the ultimate reconciliation of all of the Israelites. And he says, if the root is holy, so are the branches. And now he goes into this whole section that I'm sure you know about if you've read the scriptures much. He goes into this whole section talking about uh, the root, the olive tree and the branches and, and a lot in here. So let's, I don't want to long, long it out. Let's, let's, let's go through it. He says, if some of the branches were broken off and you... Although a wild olive shoot were grafted in amongst the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, don't be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, well, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. And that's true, Paul says. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if if Elohim did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note this kindness and the severity of Elohim. Severity towards those who have fallen, but Elohim's kindness toward you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for Elohim has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut out from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to, to, to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Wow. So what's he saying here? What is Paul on about here? Well, he, the branch... What's the root? The root is the nation, the, the collective nation, the collective uh, people of Israel. There's two, bro there's, well, there's one, bro there's one root there, which is the, the main olive tree, which is the nation of Israel. Salvation is of the Jews. You know, the prophets, even including Yeshua, said that salvation is of the Yehudi, meaning the Israelites. And then he says that Gentiles have come from another, from another uh Roots from other trees, i.e., other nations, and what he's saying here is that the branches are the individuals. Some people try and make out that no, the branches here are not individuals. They are clearly individuals. If you look at, let's go to the King James version just to really quickly show you. The good thing about the King James version and and other versions that use this old style of English is that when you see 
words such as thou and thy and thine, that tells you that it's talking about an individual entity, an individual person. And then when you see you or yours or you or yours, that is talking about collectives. So it's clear here, you see through verse 15 onwards here, Paul is talking about individuals. He says, uh, where are we? Let's have a look. Verse 17. If some of the branches be broken off, this is the King James Version using ye old English. If some of the branches be broken off and thou, i.e. individual person, being a wild olive tree from, from a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them are partakers of the root and fatness of the olive, olive tree, boast not thou individual against the branches. If thou individual, Paul's talking about individuals here. So the point he's making is that yes, individual Israelites have been broken out of the true Israel. He, he, he starts in chapter 9, he starts by saying not all Israel are of, you know, not all Israel are Israel, meaning that not all the children of the flesh are children of the promise. And that's, as I said, he makes that comment with regard to Isaac and Ishmael. And he's, he uses that kind of picture, that analogy to say that, yes, look, the true Israel are those who have who are who are of faith in Yeshua, and in case you think, oh, this is some sort of Paul anti-Israelite teaching. No, this goes back all the way back to Moshe and other prophets. So many of them talked about you know circumcise the the, the foreskin of your hearts, you know, and then a bunch of the prophets as well talked about. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. I hate your new moons and Sabbaths. I want, mer you know, I want you to defend the weak, protect the poor, the fatherless, the the widows, and so forth. Clearly, there has always been, always been, and Paul, you know, Paul quotes various portions as well from Elijah, Elia, to David, to Dawid, to Yeshayahu, Isaiah. That there was, there has always been a remnant within the nation of Israel. So what Paul's saying here isn't anything new. He's just kind of amplifying what the Tanakh, what the prophets had spoken of many centuries before him. And he's the basic point there, the, the, the controversial point here is he's saying that you, us Gentiles who, who have been grafted into the tree, the olive tree in Yeshua, us Gentiles, we can be broken out of that tree by um, if we do if we don't continue in faith, if we don't continue in um, in belief. Likewise, the flip side of that is that those Israelites who have been broken off their own tree, if they don't continue in unbelief, if they turn to Yeshua, they will be broken back in. You see, so it's a very powerful uh, comment here, a uh, very powerful teaching that Paul's giving here, and, and he then goes on here. In case you're wondering, well, what does all this mean? Like, what what's the where do we go with this then? What are you saying? That there's there's a remnant of Israelites, but uh, the rest of them will be grafted in, are you saying? And then the, the Gentiles have been grafted in, but they might be grafted out. What, what's going on here? Well, Paul kind of, in verse 25, he kind of clarifies it. extend In an extended manner, he clarifies it. He says, lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. And just on that word mystery, he uses that same word in Ephesians between chapters one and chapter three to talk about this whole joining together of Israelites and Goyim, Gentiles, you know, and for him, a, a mystery is not something that is hidden even to this day and can't you can't understand. When Paul talks about mystery, usually he's talking about something that previously wasn't fully made known by the prophets and, and so on. But now is in his age was being made known, had been made known by Yeshua and the 12 and the other uh, apostles and prophets of the, uh, the new, the new uh, covenant era. So he says, lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel. So he's, he's emphasizing that fact that part of Israel has been hardened until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Interesting, what does he mean by that? Uh, I'm not 100% sure what he means by that. He could mean that a partial hardening of, has come upon Israel until all the Gentiles have come in to faith, i.e. Or he could mean that until the, the full amount of the, go, the Goyim, the full amount of the Gentiles who are going to come in to Yeshua have come in. Either way, 
a partial hardening has come upon Israel till the fullness of the Gentiles come in and in this way all Israel shall be saved so this all and in is and in this way all Israel can, will be saved this causes christian commentators a world of problems because on the face of it it just says all israel will be saved and especially as based on what we've just been looking at talking about the branches being grafted in he talks about what will the you know if the fall of this if the trespass of, of israel has meant the reconciliation of the world what will their acceptance mean the, I, the israelites acceptance of yeshua mean but life from the dead you know and he's saying here i think it's very clear that he's saying yeah in this way or at this time is another way that you can after this time is another way you can translate that that verse even though most translations don't translate it in that way at at that time or after that time all israel will be saved i mean you know does that not mean that all Israelites will be saved? Whether that means all Israelites at that particular time will be saved or all Israelites all throughout history will be saved it remains to be seen. But I think it's got to mean one of those two things. And then he says, as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Now that is a quote from Isaiah, Yeshayahu 59. And if you know about the, 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 the prophet Isaiah, the latter part of his uh, prophecies, some people call it Deutero Isaiah, or I think they even, some people argue that there's even three sections of Isaiah. That's not the point of this particular video. But what I want to do is to quote a big portion of this, this portion of Isaiah, because the latter portion of Isaiah's prophecies are all about the blessing, the restoration, the regathering in, the, 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 the recrowning of, of Israel and Yehuda. So let's have a look, Isaiah 59, 14. Justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away. For truth has stumbled in the public sphere, sphere, squares and uprightness cannot enter. Truth is lacking, he's talking about the Yehudim, the, the Jehud, Judah. Truth is lacking and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Yah saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered wondered that there was no one to intercede then his own arm brought him salvation in a messianic context from a, from a believer in yeshua that is a reference to yeshua he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak now if you're wondering by the way if this is written in why is this written in past tense that's just one of the ways that prophetic language is you know they'll, they'll talk about something in future as if it happened in the past uh, and vice versa actually it's just one of, one of the ways that the hebrew prophets kind of operate uh, according to their deeds so he will repay to wrath to his adversaries repayment to his enemies to the coastlands i.e the gentiles he will render repayment so they shall fear the name of yah from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun for he shall come like a rushing stream which the wind of yah drives and a redeemer this is what this is the bit that paul quotes and a redeemer will come to zion and to those in jacob who turn from transgression this declares yah and as for me this is my covenant with them says yah my spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says Yah, from this time and forevermore. So, yeah, so that's 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 what Paul's talking about. Now, there's a there's a question there, actually, with regard to what version Paul was quoting from, because it's, it seems to read slightly differently to to, to this version that, that, that I've got here in the ESV. Uh, and that's that's actually a thing in the in the New Testament that they're not always quoting from the same version of the Tanakh. That raises a whole load of questions about well, what is your view of the, about the the, the the inspiration of Scripture? Is it specific words only? Specific words were inspired, or you know, it's a big big. I'll talk about that in a video one day. But the point I'm trying to make here is that Paul is talking about a time in future from he, from the time he was writing when Yah will indeed save Israel. He will indeed turn away transgression from Zion he will indeed bring his people back and he will pour his spirit on his people and so forth and in that context Paul is saying in that context that is when all Israel shall be saved now you might still be on the reader perhaps might still have been like 
uh, I still don't really know what you mean, Paul. And then now Paul goes into kind of overdrive <laughs> and he closes it out with this uh, deal, break, deal breaker, really, when it comes to universal reconciliation of the Israelites. He says, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Israel are enemies for your sake, the Gentiles. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of the forefathers. For the gifts and calling of Elohim are irrevoc irrevocable. For just as you were once at one time were disobedient to Elohim, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For Elohim has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. And again, that verse 20, 32 there causes Christian commentators a bunch of problems. They don't like that because on the face of it there, what's he saying? He's saying that these unbelieving Israelites, yes, at the moment they are enemies as such because of the gospel, but they are still the elect of the Most High. They are still the called, the foreknown nation of the Most High. And the gifts and the calling of Elohim are irre irrevocable. Irre irre irrevocable. <laughs> Irreversible, I'm just going to say. The promises that the Most High made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and so forth, those promises are they will not be taken back. They are irre irreversible. And thus, because of that, on the basis of that, Paul is saying that, look, yeah, right now they are disobedient and that disobedience has meant that the blessings have come to the Gentiles, but they will receive mercy. The Most High has, uh, has uh, shown mercy to you Gentiles and he will show mercy to the unbelieving Israelites. All Israel shall be saved. And this is what he's amplifying what he means by that. The Elohim has consigned them all to disobedience, i.e. he has shut their eyes and darkened their hearts and so forth because of their unbelief, because of their disobedience. He's kind of, uh, you know, sealed that disobedience, but he will have mercy on them all at some point in the future. And that is what I'm, that's what my understanding is of Paul here. This is why I think he is indeed teaching universal reconciliation of Israelites. And then he closes it out with a kind of little bit of a, praise of, of the Most High Yah really. He says, Oh, the depths and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of Elohim, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of Yah or has been his counsellor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. And that's the point. If you... Chapter 11 comes at the end of a whole section. You could even say it's just from chapter 1 onwards, but certainly from about chapters 8 and 9, 10, 11, they're all together. In 8, he's talking about the predestination, the predest foreknowledge, calling, election, predestination of, an, of, a, of, of, of those who are in Yeshua. First night, chapter 9, he talks about how, you know, some of the Israelites have been elect, uh, are part of the remnant now, but there's a time coming when even those who have been who Yah has hardened will turn to Yeshua and will be saved and then he, he finishes it off by saying yeah this is some deep stuff man I understand this is deep and Paul's almost like you know hallelujah this is deep this is a big vision this this goes against what you might be thinking you Gentiles might be thinking that the Israelites have been cut off forever no and it might be going against you Israelites who are thinking that well no Gentiles can't come in no Paul is saying that this has been the plan and the, the project of the Most High throughout the ages. And so he kind of gives this sort of um, effusive praise and glory and honour to the Most High uh, because of this, this plan of reconciliation. So I'll stop there. That's my understanding of Romans chapter 11. This is why I think uh, all Israelites will ultimately be saved. Uh, in other chapters, in other parts of Paul's writings, I think it becomes clear. In other parts of the, the Tanakh, actually, the more I cross-reference the, the, the quotes that Paul gives and other, others give, even Yeshua gives from the Tanakh, you start to see that actually they weren't inventing something new. They were just amplifying what had already been said or hinted at in the Tanakh. And so this idea of all of Israel being reconciled is, is, is in Paul's mind absolutely here. And it kind of dovetails very nicely with his idea of all of creation actually being reconciled and all 
every tongue confessing that Yeshua is Lord and every knee bowing to his throne. Amen. All right. Thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts. Take care and I'll see you next time.